Hey everyone, my name is Arun Pandian. I'm the owner of Signal Core Recording here in Dumbo, Brooklyn. I started my career as the lead guitar player for Lauren Hill on the Miseducation of Lauren Hill album. I toured the world with her for a couple years, and then after that, I segued into production and engineering. I've been doing that for almost 20 years now. This is my studio. I've modeled it after uh, old studios that were in the 70s, like Abbey Road and Stax and Motown where um, it's a highly curated list of gear so that the studio has its own sound. Um, and you're not just a commercial studio that just caters to everyone. I want people to come here for a reason. And the reason, hopefully, is the work that I do and the work that the engineers do that come here and the sound that the studio produces. Currently, I'm running the master's program at Berkeley NYC for songwriting and production alongside running the studio. Some of my credits include Mumford & Son, uh, John Legend, Nora Jones, also, David Lang, uh, he's a new music composer. I do a lot of work with Gabriel Garcon Montano. I recorded and mixed his album, Aguita, here, and we are currently working on a salsa record with the Fania All-Stars and his next album, which is a follow-up to Aguita. Lead up to how I got this Helios console, when I started the studio and I decided I wanted a console, I originally invested in a lot of Siemens gear. So at one point in time, I had probably the largest collection of Siemens and WSW, which is the Austrian branch of Siemens gear in the world. I acquired all that gear over about 10 years. I ended up selling my WSW console to The National, and you can find that at their Long Pond Studios in upstate New York. I purchased the console from Heidi Miller, who was the manager of Heliocentric Studios in England and the wife at the time of Chris Difford. And this console was originally owned by Elvis Costello and Chris Difford, and they put it together for their studio uh, in England. Like I mentioned, the uh, console is from two consoles, one that was located at Island Basting Street Studio 2, which recorded Stairway to Heaven and a bunch of other Rolling Stones and David Bowie. And the other half of the console was from Alvin Lee's Hook and Manor Studios, which recorded a bunch of other stuff. Helios consoles have a special uh, place in my heart. A lot of the British rock records were done on it, and it has a certain angular and punchy sound to it that other consoles of the era just don't have. Dick Swettenham, the designer, uh, designed a really fantastic EQ and mic pre that just channels that punchiness of those British rock records that a lot of us love and listen to over and over again. I started my career uh, learning from uh, Henry Hirsch, who recorded the first three Lenny Kravitz records. And he's the one that turned me on to the sound of the Helios, the sound of the line channels, and the sound of the EQ. And when I heard that, I realized one day I hopefully would either have a few channels, and now I, lucky enough, have a whole console. The console was put together by a guy named Cyril Jones. He was the, probably the last person to work with Dick, Dick Swetnam on a Helios project in the 90s. And they had to put these two consoles together that came from two different studios, were two different voltages, and two different formats. So he had the job of putting it together, and he was the right person for the job because he's the one that started Rain Dirk and was involved with Helios from some of its earliest stages. When uh, Dick Swetnam invented the Helios console, before he invented the Helios console, he designed uh, the Olympic console, which is at Olympic Studios. And that console is a germanium console that can kind of be considered the prototype for what became the Type 69 Helios uh, silicon versions. And that Olympic console is in Canada at the moment at a museum, a music museum. And Cyril Jones was the one that was uh, tasked to modify that console. And if you go look at that console, online, you will see that there are a lot of similarities between uh, this console and that one, uh, particularly the way Cyril set up the busing and uh, a lot of the routing features that are located on that console. And so what was special about this Helios is it was redone in the 90s and so has a lot of modern flair to it in terms of its busing capabilities and its headphone capabilities and the way he has set it up. But it's very similar to the way he modified the original Olympic console. One of the original features of this console is the ADR accessories that are located over here on the left. We have the ADR compressors and the ADR EQs. Audio design and recording, which is ADR, was um, who Helios hired to do most of the compressors that you see in all their consoles. So even though they're labeled Helios, they were designed by audio design and recording. And these modules were uh, original to the Alvin Lee setup at Hookend Manor. 
This section over here is a monitoring system designed by Cyril. Probably has some features that he put on Rain Dirt consoles. Uh, the cool thing about it is that it is completely separate from the console, so it has its own setup for auxes and fullbacks. So you can completely give the musicians exactly what they want without interfering with anything that's going on in the main console. So one of the special things about Helios is the punchy and angular sound. A lot of the ways those Zeppelin records sound like that is because the engineers would record through the Helios channels, which already had a punchy sound to it. They would run it to tape, and then they would run it back through the console and juke up the line amps to get it to stand up, as we call it, to get it, give it really like an overdriven uh, sound. And then they'd compress it and put it back onto tape. So that's one of the tricks is the way engineers used to use these old consoles is constantly rerunning uh, everything through the line amps and riding them hot so that uh, when they bounced tracks down, they were getting the sounds as the process of the recording was going along. On the Helios console, the mid-range is a really special part of the EQ. I particularly like the 700 hertz range to get rid of boxiness in recordings. It's kind of like the secret trick of mine to uh, make a bad recording sound good. And then you can, uh, on this console, just like the original Olympic console, you can stack EQs together. So I can steal EQs from any channel I want and uh, daisy chain them together and reduce on one channel and then boost on another channel. And so it provides a lot of flexibility in what you can do. Over here on the console, there's a little control box that Alvin Lee used to use. He had it set up with three Studer Revox machines and it had like a very speed control on it and he would use it for like special effects and all his delays sending out to those machines. Uh, it's not set up now, but it will be soon. So generally, uh, my workflow in the studio is different from most studios. I record all my basic tracks to tape, and the particular machines I use are 3M machines. Uh, they were used on a lot of British recordings, and even uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller. The reason I like these machines, and in general, the equipment I choose for the studio is I prefer equipment that has as little electronics as possible, so it doesn't mess with the sound and cause phase issues when you have tons of electronics and gear, it tends to mess with your frequency ranges. And so these tape machines have very little on each card, very little electronics, and they have nice big fat transformers. And so what I do is I have musicians come in here and believe it or not, I'm more than the sound, I'm using tape for the workflow that it provides to a session because everybody has to perform. We are doing less takes so that we don't have to make decisions on the back end. I get the sounds to tape, which means I'm compressing and adding EQ and really driving the sounds as they are being recorded so that the recording sounds like almost a finished product as it's going down to tape. And because you are limited in tracks, uh, what that forces you to do is only record what's important to the song and not mess around a lot of time with like two hours spending on a shaker or something like that. So we record the foundation of the album once the tape is filled. I run it through the console and drive it some more, and then I print it to uh, Pro Tools, and then the rest of the recording is finished and edited in Pro Tools. And a lot of times the vocals are done in Pro Tools. A question I get asked a lot is why do I use uh, vintage speakers? I got a collection of vintage speakers. So in the back behind me, you can see the Tannoy Lockwoods, which were used at Olympic. Over here in front of me, I have an Alltech 612 cabinet, which is the Beatles speaker. And above that, I have a Yuri 811. And the Yuri was the next generation of the Alltech designed by Bill Putnam to like replace it. And the reason I have these vintage speakers is I use them as filters to hear what the engineers were hearing in the room. So when I listen to a Beatles recording on the Alltech, I'm literally hearing exactly what they heard when they made the recording. And with the Tannoys, I'm hearing what Zeppelin heard when they made the recording. And with the Yuri 811s, I'm hearing most of like 70s style recordings that were done and also early 80s recordings. So the workflow in the studio is that I get it to sound good on all the different speakers. And each speaker provides me with a different listening experience and I EQ it to sound good in all of them. And I quickly switch between all three. And as soon as it sounds good in all three, I know I'm good to go. Over here in this rack, these are some of my most prized possessions. We have about 10 channels of Eckmiller EQs. This is related to all the Eastern European quality broadcast EQs and filters. Each one of these things weighs like up 10 pounds, built like a brick shithouse. The tank could roll over it and it would survive. And these are just low cuts and high cuts and some mid boosts, but um, they're made with such high quality components and they have such an amazing sound to them. Uh, so I use them for a variety of things.
Down here, this piece of gear is an RCA stereo mastering EQ. I have only seen one other version of this. It was owned by Lenny Kravitz, and it took me 10 years to find another one. Henry used to use it on my recordings to master it, and he was able to just carve out frequencies and do all kinds of things to my recordings, and you couldn't even tell there was an EQ on it, and he completely changed the sound of the recordings. It looks very similar to a GML. Um, I don't know when it was made, but it was designed. I have a picture of a Italian mastering house, and there's five or six of these. And I've only seen this is the only second one I've ever seen uh, in the world. So uh, I don't know if anybody else has one, but if you have one, I will buy it. Over here on the right, I have my Siemens ELA EQs. These were designed by Siemens for their Italian branch. And they're two big giant mono EQs, and they're set up in different sections from lows to highs. And you can either boost or cut in uh, certain frequencies. And it has the ability where you push these two buttons right here, and you can get the center frequency that's in the middle. But they just sound big and beautiful. And um, I've loved them ever since I got them. And now I can't afford them because the prices have jumped up so much. As I said earlier, I'm a Siemens fanatic, or at least I'm a recovering Siemens fanatic. So I have these original Siemens racks that are all vintage that I custom made to be house rack gear. They, they were originally designed for hi-fi equipment. These compressors here are WSW, which is the Austrian branch of Siemens. They're some of my favorite compressors ever made. They're broadcast. You can run a whole mix through it. I love to use them for parallel compression. I have a fourth one, but a tech has it right now, and I'm having him modify it to see if we can get some more uh, cool features out of it that don't exist already. Below this are NTP compressors. These are some of the first compressors Henry Hirsch told me about. They were like the secret sauce for some mastering engineers in the 90s and the 80s. We can really hold uh, tight onto something. And uh, once again, it's similar to this, but another version of it, maybe like a little smaller of a sound. This is kind of a big, huge, big sound. And this is kind of a tighter version of that. Below that, this is serial number one and serial number two of a compressor that's being designed by Henry Hirsch and Chip for Speak that they are just now releasing to market. The beautiful thing about this is it was the only compressor I've ever heard that actually beat these. They're modern versions, but they're also cleaner. So you can really uh, reduce uh, signal by like 16 dB and you can't even tell it's being compressed. So these are just now coming to market and uh, definitely look out for these. Below that, we have early versions of the famous Pi compressors that I just recently acquired. Something else in this rack I'd like to feature is the Yuri Cooper Time Cube, which is amazing for adding stereo width to stuff and also as a send to my EMT plate which is located in the back. Yeah and then I have some B76s as a stereo pair just as an alternative choice to the Helios. It's kind of a completely different sound more close to my WSW console that I used to own. A lot of what I do is I like to balance transients in my mixes and so I use the Alicia and the SPL transient designers to really uh, create some tonal difference between the characteristics in a mix. It's kind of a secret weapon to create space uh, in drums and bass rhythms, and um, both of these do excellent things, and they are really great pieces. And so I suggest you get them if you're looking for hardware uh, transient designers. Over here is a little delay effects setup. I have the uh, Echoplex, which is famously used by Jimmy Page. I have the Guild Echorec, which is famously used by Pink Floyd, David Gilmore. And then this one is a little less known, called an Echolet 5. I hate to talk about it on video because now the prices of this are going to jump up. But it's great for delays, short delays, and it's also a really great guitar preamp to drive your guitar direct in. Over here is one of my favorite possessions of the studio that I just got. It's an 1811 Arard piano. Arard was a French manufacturer. This is a Rard London. And the cool thing about this piano is it is a straight strung piano. And uh, you can come over here and look at the uh, way the piano is strung. Um, most modern pianos after 1900s uh, were developed into cross strung. And what that allowed the manufacturers to do is make a shorter length piano and still have a longer bass string. But what that does is if the bass strings are crossing the other strings, they resonate at the same time. So the benefit of that, no matter what key you play, all the strings are resonating. The benefit of that is that the piano is louder 
but then everything becomes more compressed and the keys all kind of sound the same. And most of your favorite composers from classical music actually wrote their music on a straight strung piano. And the cool thing about a straight strung is because it's straight strung and the, all the strings aren't resonating as much, you get a variation as you go up the octave in the piano. So it almost sounds like a symphony. So you'll have like your basses and your oboes and your brass section. And um, it's a very unique sound and a, a kind of a more clear sound. So when you play like big chords on like a Beethoven recording, you actually hear all the individual notes instead of it sounding like kind of one big uh, mush. So I, I, I like this piano as an alternative to something like a Steinway or a Mason and Hamlin, which I have in the other room. And um, one thing I haven't mentioned is that the studio is moving to a much bigger space. So I'm looking forward to putting this in a large room um, and allowing people to hear the difference between a straight strong and a cross strong. So over here we have a Celeste or a Celesta. Don't know the exact pronunciation, but this is one of those beautiful uh, bell-like instruments. I used it in a lot of Gabriel Garcon Montano's recordings. You can hear it on there. Yeah, I've always wanted one of these. Henry Hirsch had a studio that had one owned by a Thelonious Monk, and every time I played that, I always wanted one for my own, so I, I got this uh, got this one just like it, and uh, it's beautiful. I use it on a lot of recordings. I also have this Emu SP1200, which is a famous hip-hop sampling drum machine. I have a big history of hip-hop in my career, and so I have a lot of drum machines that are associated with that. I also have an MPC60, and I used to do a lot of beats, uh, hip-hop beat production, worked for G-Unit uh, in my past, so I, I like to still have those machines in the studio. Over here, we have a Honer clavinet duo. The cool thing about the duo is that it's a clavinet and a pianet in one. So you can actually blend the two sounds together or have them independent of each other. So that's why I picked this one for the studio. And then I have my Emulator 2, which is early 80s sampler used on Depeche Mode and Peter Gabriel recordings. It's really great. And I got all the discs and all the sounds and put it onto a scan disc so we can basically get every single sound that this ever had uh, on one disc. So one of my recent bass acquisitions that I'm really proud of is this Rickenbacker 4000. The Helios console came from Chris Difford and the uh, Rickenbacker 4000 was used in, by the bass player of the Squeeze. So I was really great to acquire one for the studio and it has just a really special woody tone that I actually like better than the later Rickenbacker models. At the studio, I have uh, like classic vintage mics. I have the U47 and M49 and the U67, but um, I thought I'd feature some kind of lesser known mics. This EV642, it's maybe the only mic to receive an Oscar. It was used for voiceovers, like recording the actors on stage. They would have it on a large boom. But what I like to use it for is to get punch from like a kick drum. I use, also use it for all my bass recordings. I got this trick from Henry Hirsch. And also for, um, apparently at Olympic Studios, they would use one of these uh, 20 feet high above the drums and it gives a really nice spank to the drums and a real punchy sound. So it's kind of like a secret weapon of the studio. Some other mics that you might not have seen before, uh, these are Tannoy, they're called Parliament mics because apparently they were used in the British Parliament and they're really amazing ribbon mics, and they're really hard to find, and they're great on acoustic instruments. So I use these a lot for recording any acoustic instruments at the studio. Over here, another mic that you might not have seen is a mic made by Fairchild, the famous compressor company. And these are the Fairchild Synchrons, and they're just a really beautiful hi-fi sounding mic. These originally operated off a battery, and so you have to get them modified to phantom power. So these get used a lot at the studio, and there's some mics you might not have seen in other studios. Rachel and I would like to thank you for coming to Signal Core Recording. Uh, please follow me on Instagram at Signal Core Recording and Rachel at... Mixed by Rachel. Um, and any questions you have about any of the gear or anything you saw in the videos, please reach out to us. And we hope that this can help you make better records as you continue on your path.